everybody. Thank you all for coming. I want to welcome you all here tonight for this very, very special uh, anniversary uh, celebration for Apollo 15. It's a special, special event for me to be uh, here, uh, be the chairman of the board of uh, Astronaut Scholarship Foundation as of last May. It's a very, very special uh, event, and we thank you all for being here and supporting us and uh, honoring uh, good friends uh, and uh, great American heroes, the crew of Apollo 15. We've got people here from uh, all of, almost all over the world, uh, and uh, so uh, not only our U.S. Uh, supporters, but uh, people, friends from Italy and uh, people from South Africa, soon to be naturalized citizens, or almost, and, uh, and so uh, we just uh, appreciate y'all uh, uh, support. So what a great evening we're having. Uh, as a newly elected chairman, I must say it is an honor to be here and to lead uh, such an amazing organization. Uh, our uh, staff has uh, worked very, very hard to pull this event off, and so we hope that you all enjoy it. And uh, I want to thank all of them, which I'll do appropriately in a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> you know, nobody needs to uh, have me tell you how important uh, the work that we are doing in this uh, organization is. Uh, you've heard from Ashley earlier, and she is just one of hundreds of our astronaut scholars who are out there making scientific breakthroughs and leading America into our technological future. Uh, the foundation could not award these scholarships, with, of course, without your uh, loyal support. And so please continue to give uh, and uh, give big, we hope, so that we can increase our uh, scholarships uh, and uh, uh, support the uh, new technological revolution uh, in the U.S. Uh, it's, I think it's one of the biggest investments we can all make is to help these uh, aspiring young students in uh, the, uh, in the uh, science and engineering uh, field. We've got uh, the, our sponsors' uh, logos are behind us here, so I'd like to re recognize our sponsors. Uh, First, uh, our friends at the Courtyard uh, by Marriott in Cocoa Beach. Uh, Tom Williamson is here. Uh, there you are, Tom. Thank you. And Maria Shelton is with him. And uh, thank you, Maria. We appreciate all your great support. Thank you so much. And uh, our longtime uh, ASF uh, Board of uh, uh, Trustees member and, and tremendous supporter of this uh, organization, Jim Long, and I know Jim was, I saw Jim earlier, where's Jim? There you are. Hey, Jim, stand, wave to the crowd. And uh, it's just uh, very, very special to have supporters such as Jim uh, to be with us on just about every event we have. As well as our friends from NASA uh, who helped support us, uh, our Kennedy Space Center director, Bob Cabana, is here. There's, where's Bob? Oh, there's Bob. There you are. <laughs> Our hero shuttle astronaut, commander, and uh, center director. Uh, his external uh, uh, relations director, Cheryl, is here. Is, there's Cheryl. And uh, also Pam Steele, the uh, chief of public services. There's Pam. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Appreciate your support. <laughs> We're so glad that y'all could join us tonight. And also uh, here is uh, Delaware North at Parks and uh, Resorts. Uh, they're operating the Kennedy Space Center, uh, Vista Center, I should say, uh, complex. And so they are a wonderful sponsor and a wonderful partner for us. And we have been friends uh, with uh, Delaware North over the years. And uh, Bill Moore is here. Thank you, Bill, for uh, supporting us. We really, really thank you for all that you do for uh, the uh, foundation and for the space program as a whole. And uh, finally, we have uh, Ron, uh, uh, I mean, Carl Ronstrom, uh, who's our photographer. There he is. He does all the pictures. 
and he's a faithful supporter for us, and we certainly appreciate uh, his, uh, his uh, endeavor and <coughs> his support. Uh, <coughs> so uh, all of these organizations are supportive of the foundation and our mission to back the best and brightest college students uh, producing, uh, pursuing their STEM uh, degrees, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. While we're also promoting the importance of technology and space exploration with events such as these. Last but certainly not least, I need to thank the ASFF, AS Astronaut Scholarship Foundation team uh, and a core group of volunteers. Lynn LeBlanc and uh, has worked tirelessly night and day. And all the girls uh, involved, two Christians and Nicole and Beth and uh, uh, Jesse, where is everybody? Y'all wave your hands at least. You're here, I know. We just thank you so much for, uh, there they are, for uh, uh, helping us out and just doing a great job to make it this a wonderful evening for everyone. Uh, I really enjoy working with them and to uh, getting to uh, know them on a personal level and also just to have this opportunity to uh, work with such a great get bunch of gals that really believe in what uh, we're doing. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, we also have a group of great, great group of volunteers, as I said, who are always here to help us to put together uh, this great event tonight. And they work on a daily basis from morning to night to ensure that the foundation continues to grow uh, and surpass the, vi uh, the vision of its founders, who were the original uh, seven uh, astronauts. So let's give them all a round of applause. And so to start our program off this evening, uh, we uh, would like you to welcome a great hero and a great friend of mine, a mentor of mine, uh, my good friend, Neil Armstrong. Neil, you're on. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Ladies and gentlemen, we uh, gather this evening to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the flight of Apollo 15 to Hadley Rill. Now 11, 12, 13, and 14 had all been commanded by naval aviators. <laughs> but Apollo 15, would not only be commanded by, but manned by a completely Air Force crew. <laughs> they would be the fourth flight to successfully touch down on Luna. <laughs> they called it a voyage to Hadley Rill. Uh, but that's a little like saying the shuttle lands at Indian River. <laughs> Close, but not exactly. <laughs> Apollo 15 actually landed intentionally at a place cut called Palos Putridinus. Uh, in this building, you will find that defined as the Marsh of Decay. <laughs> uh, other Latin experts say a more accurate description is either the rotten marsh or the rotting marsh. <laughs> The crew kept this pretty well hidden from the press. <laughs> I'll defer to Dave and Al to explain why they picked it in the first place. <laughs> now, all, all the Astros and the flight directors and controllers 
were familiar with the term sim. Uh, the simulation exercises that we depended upon to prepare us for the perplexing anomalies that inevitably accompanied actual flight. Uh, but Al had a different kind of sim. It was the scientific instrument module. Is that right, Al? Yeah. Packed with all kinds of measuring instruments for determin determining the hidden secrets of Luna. Now, put yourself in Al's place. You're on your first trip into space. You find yourself 240,000 miles away from home in some 30-ton spacecraft, and your crewmates have deserted you. <laughs> they are off to Luna. You are all alone. <laughs> well, maybe you have your teddy bear with you. I, 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 I. But you are in complete command and you have the sole responsibility for doing the piloting, doing the navigation, managing the myriad of spacecraft systems, communicating with mission control, making your own meals, <laughs> doing the house cleaning, and on top of all that, operating a dozen or more very complex suite of instruments, cameras, spectrometers, lasers, etc., to the complete satisfaction of some very demanding principal events investigators back on Earth. And should the lunar module crew, Dave and Jim, get themselves in some sort of an errant orbit. After launching from the lunar surface, you would be required to find a way using your own propulsion and navigation to rendezvous with the lunar module and rescue your crewmates, crewmates all by yourself. <laughs> A very challenging task. The media continually missed or neglected the importance and the difficulty of the CMP's job. But all of us here tonight certainly cannot miss it. The Apollo 13 crew, and Apollo 15 crew were particularly physically fit. They could have handled the lunar surface work with ease. So it's a bit ironic that they were the first to get a sort of a Jeep <laughs> to ride around in. Of course, the Jeep added weight, required the lunar module to have more fuel for the descent to the lunar surface, and the extra fuel required bigger tanks. And all of these, plus the extra big max that the crew demanded, raised the limb weight about two tons. The Jeep, which they called the LRV, NASA loves acronyms, <laughs> did allow Dave and Jim to actually go 
from Rotting Marsh <laughs> over to Hadley Rill, thereby semi-legitimizing <laughs> their calling the summer vacation a voyage to Hadley Rill. <laughs> much, much of the film and recorded data from Al's sim would be located back in the service module, way back behind where they were staying. And it would be destroyed during the re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. So Al had to put on his spacesuit and go out and get it. He did an EVA yeah. somewhere out in that great unknown between Earth and Moon and retrieved the precious cargo information. He had a panoramic view that, to my knowledge, no other person has ever seen. Dave, Al, and Jim did a outstanding job of completing a very difficult mission. And they have my sincere congratulations. Now let's take a look back in time by video with the crew of Apollo 15 and the voyage to Rotting Marsh. <laughs> Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars, and let me see what spring is like on a Jupiter and Mars. Ignition sequence In other start, words, engines on, five, four, song and let me sing forevermore you are all i long for all i worship and adore in other words please be true oh boy it's beautiful out here words, reminds me of sun valley There's a simple plaque with 14 names. And those are the names in alphabetical order of all the astronauts and cosmonauts who have died in the pursuit of exploration of space. Fill my heart with song. Let me sing forevermore. You are all.
Thank you. I'm uh, Jerry Griffin. I was happened to be the lead flight director for Apollo 15. Some people probably wonder what a lead flight director is. Well, in mission control, um, we had to work 24-7, although that was not a term we used then. And uh, so we had three or four shifts. We actually kind of went back and forth between using three and four. Each team was led by a flight director, but one was designated as the lead. Worked with the crew, worked with the program office, made sure everything was ready for the flight. Um, I was about six feet one. Um, <laughs> Joe, Joe was about the same. But uh, Apollo 15 beat us down. Um, we had uh, a lot of fun with the flight. It was, uh, and I'll be fast about this because we're running a little behind, but there's, there is uh, a feeling sometime about what it took to get us even to Apollo 15. And we stood on the shoulders of Mercury, Gemini, the first eight flights of, of uh, Apollo just to get to the point that we could fly 15. And, um, so it was, a, it was a team effort built up from, from the beginning. It wasn't a one-time occurrence. Uh, we knew what we were doing. We were pretty cocky, but we had pretty good reason to be. We, we did know what we were doing. And um, so I'm honored to be here to celebrate this one particularly. Dave, Dave and I, over the years, have remained very close. We've, we've done a lot of things together. And uh, it's always nice to get the whole family back together, though, and that's what I feel like this is, is, is really family. Um, the J missions, I wanted to say real quickly, and you're going to hear some more about this. The J missions are what we call the last three missions. J just was a block of spacecraft. And as Neil, and remind me never to follow Neil again, <laughs> uh, that, that's a hard act to follow. Um, the J missions, uh, those last three spacecraft, uh, had had the rover. They had uh, more stay time. Um, we had the SEM bay that that uh, Al had to take care of, uh, but we really had a very very capable team. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that when I get the crew up here. And it's now time to do that. Um, first of all, I'd like to get Commander Dave Scott in CMP. Oh, that other guy, Al Warden. Uh, get you to come up here and join me. And probably um, another reason I'm not six feet one anymore, uh, the backup crew. Um, Dick Gordon, Vance Brand. And there's Jack Smith. I couldn't even find him on the row there. We're missing one crewman, if you'll note. Um, unfortunately, Jim Irwin passed away in 1991. One heck of a pilot, great guy to work with, calm, cool, quiet. Uh, reminds me a little bit of Neil Armstrong. Uh, Sometimes didn't have a lot to say, but when he said something, you better listen, because it was right. And so Jim can't be with us tonight, but we, I'm very happy to say that Mary is here and with her family. Please stand up. And where's the rest of your family? Stand up. Okay, as I mentioned, the J missions, very much um, kind of the cream of the crop at the end of the program that we had been able to build on. Uh, I think one of the, the way I like to say it is that for the first several missions to the moon, I know in the control center, we were worried about the transportation, getting them up there, getting them back, and make sure we didn't leave anybody or kill anybody trying to do it. Um, something happened, though, between 14 and 15. We actually ended up, we were very fortunate that Dave Scott, and we also had on the backup crew, Jack Smith, very much interested in the science. Um, 
Oh, I forgot Joe. God. God, how can you forget little Joe? Well, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That baby face guy you saw up there, Joe Allen. Joe, come on up. I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. Joe, uh, Joe was the Capcom for all of the EVAs. He was also, I noticed, I went back in the transcript, he was also uh, uh, up there. He was on duty for a lot of other stuff in that flight. But And Jerry, and, yeah. Jerry, uh, I know why you did it, because I always thought it, that you were the lead flight director. I the didn't know the word was the lead. <laughs> OK, got it. <laughs> Well, anyway, back to something more serious. And uh, <laughs> uh, the J missions, we had we had two guys that were really we had a scientist as a backup crewman, but we had a commander that really understood that it was time to kind of shift. I think, kind of shift the mode that we'd been operating in from that transportation focus to a science focus. And Dave came to me and said, "Do you want to go out on a field geology trip?" with us and see what we actually do to get ready for, for this and also understand a little more about the moon. And I jumped at it. I had, and it turned out it started to trend that from then till the end of the program, we had a lot of program management, even from NASA headquarters, that went out with these crews later on and studied what they were doing and really got focused on it. So we really had the focus on, on science and that's what I wanted to get Dave first to talk about, kind of what led you down that path, and also um, your value, uh, what you think about the value of that training, uh, the field geology stuff. Well, the, the, like all of it, there are a lot of pieces to this sort of thing. I was, I was lucky in the queue, I was lucky in the flights I got to fly, and being able to get ready for 15, I'd flown Jiminy 8, more on that later. Apollo 9, I learned a command module. Uh, got ready for 15, and uh, Jim Irwin was absolutely the expert in the lunar module. I didn't have to learn much, Jim was there. Al was so tuned into the command module, I didn't have to think about that, so I had to find something to do. <laughs> and I thought, gee, you know, this rock stuff is pretty cool. And so I was looking around. We would had these geology courses that eh, pretty boring. And finally, Jack Schmidt came up and said, hey, I got the right instructor for you. And I thought, boy, I sure hope so. So all of a sudden shows up Lee Silver from Caltech, who was absolutely the most brilliant professor I have ever had. And he lit the fire. He really lit the fire. So I was lucky. I got there at the right time. I had a great professor. And I had Jack as a tutor constantly. So there was Jack. There was Lee Silver. You know, Al had the command module handled. Jim had the lunar module handled. Shoot, I had, a, I had the geology wired, man. How could I miss? And that's where I really got to it. Yeah. I bet you got more advice and stuff from Schmidt than you probably wanted to have. But uh, we'll let him filibuster on that in a minute. Um, being a former senator. Um, Al, this is your first flight. You went all the way to the moon, did all that. Do you have any surprises? Any surprises that came up? Um, surprises on a flight? Yeah, we had a few. Um, uh, I guess nothing really heroic or, or, or catastrophic. Uh, we had a water leak inside the command module one day. Uh, now, you might not think that a leaky faucet is a big deal uh, because normally it just all drains down and it's gone. However, when you get in space, uh, a leaky faucet is kind of a problem because what you get is a ball of water on the end of the faucet that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and if it breaks away, it can go behind the instrument panel and it could cause lots of electrical problems. Uh, I am convinced that the solution to this problem is why we send people into space uh, rather than robots, because robots would never figure this out. You'll never guess what the solution was. Well, the solution was 
We got a towel and we wrapped it around that bubble of water and we absorbed it. A uh, very simple thing, but a robot would never think about that. Anyway, there were a couple of other surprises that I probably should mention. I don't want to put my commander down, uh, but I thought maybe I should mention a couple of things. One is when the first stage shut down uh, during our launch, uh, Jim Irwin and I found ourselves uh, flailing like crazy to stay away from the instrument panel because we're going from four and a half Gs one way to maybe a half a G the other way. Uh, that was a big surprise, and I recall Jim and I both looking at Dave and saying, hmm, what about that? And Dave said, gee, guys, I forgot to tell you about that. <laughs> so so uh, you know, a couple of things like that. Woke up the next morning after we got in space, had the worst backache of my life, and Dave says, gee, guys, I forgot to tell you about that. So. There's a couple of things like that. No big deal. You know, we survived it. It was fine. But from the mechanical standpoint, we only had two things that I can think of. Uh, one was the water leak, and the other was we had a short in one of the uh, uh, electrical lines to the service propulsion system engine that we had to work around. And those are the only two things I can think of. It had the glass and the lunar module? Oh, the glass and lunar module. Yeah. We had the, yeah. yeah, but Jim took care of that. Oh, he did? Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, so there was we that go. with uh, duct tape? No, actually, you had... It was vacuum cleaner. What Vacuum cleaner. One of the panels on one of the instruments broke during launch, mm -hmm. and there were glass shards floating around. Jim went into the lunar module to check it out. There were glass shards all over the place. So uh, that got handled by a quick call down to MCC, get the vacuum cleaner and suck it all up, and we cleaned that dude up, too. We're not sure we got it all, though, are we? I mean, we never really were assured that everything was cleaned up. Probably not. But it was enough so that it didn't cause us any problems. You know, it was a very clean flight. Those yes, problems, that's all, the whole point. Those problems a happen, very clean Those flight. kind of things happen on, on several of the flights, but we had some really serious stuff that we had to deal with, and 15 was one of those that we just kind of sailed through. Before I get too far from the uh, science, I want to jump over to Jack. Uh, give us your recollections about all that. How, training engineers and fighter pilots and all that kind of thing, trying to teach them some science and flight directors. Uh, well, one of the first things that I realized after uh, joining the <laughs> astronaut corps in 1965-66 was that uh, pilots are very much like geologists. They're good observers. And so uh, I felt we had raw meat to work with. <laughs> because that's all a good geologist uh, pretends to be, is a good observer. What we had to do was give them some feeling for why they were going to observe things on the moon. That was a little more challenging. But nevertheless, uh, with the help of people like Lee Silver and Dick Johns and others that I called into uh, uh, the uh, effort, and, and I particularly have to acknowledge Jim Lovell's uh, leadership because Al Shepard told me that if you're going to do that kind of training, it changed the whole paradigm and bring it into the astronaut office. You got to have somebody to uh, lead, and Jim Lovell's up next. And so I went to Jim and I said, Jim, would you like to try this training program? And he said, sure, why not? And even though he didn't get to practice it on the moon, he uh, sort of led the effort to make it legitimate within the office. Very, very important. And at the same time, uh, people over in Mission Control, I hate to give them credit for anything, <laughs> but uh, yeah. at the same time, uh, people over years. there, Gene Kranz, uh, uh, Jerry, uh, damn, I wish I remember his name, Jerry Griffin, <laughs> uh, they, uh, they became interested early, even earlier than that in having a science support room. And uh, many of the same people that helped did. Dave out and Jim Irwin out, uh, were people that were going to be in that science support room. And, uh, and uh, I have to then bring in another name, Gordon Swan, many of you remember, who worked with Gene Kranz and, and others uh, to create the science support room, which uh, has continued, I guess, to this day as an important part of the, of the mission control operation. <clears throat> and indeed participated, even participated in the final sims that uh, you all had and that uh, uh, we had on, the, on succeeding missions. Uh, so uh, when you're dealing with raw material like engineers and pilots who uh, really are basically observers and, and rapid thinkers and, and people who like to look at alternative, uh, what geologists like to call multiple working hypotheses on how to solve problems, 
I, I think it was a foregone conclusion that with uh, these kind of people uh, carrying the torch uh, for science that it was going to be very successful, and indeed it was. My science colleagues will tell you that the Apollo suite of samples, the Apollo observations, the images that were taken uh, are really a remarkable reservoir of information about not, not just about the moon, but about the early history of the moon and the early history of our Earth, and that, uh, and that continues today. Uh, th those, those samples from Apollo 15 and all the missions are still being worked on. I don't know who's paying for it, uh, but there are dedicated people out there just learning all sorts of things all the time uh, about the moon and ultimately about the Earth by working on those samples. So thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Uh, we mentioned, it's been mentioned several times, we had a lunar rover um, uh, on, this, uh, on this flight for the first time. I wanted to get Dave maybe to say a little bit what the rover, what it handled like and what it was like. Maybe get Dick's, uh, I know Dick must have trained uh, as a backup, and see if you correlated the, uh, what you did on the Earth, and then what was it like what was comparatively like when you got it on the lunar surface? Was it easier, tougher, harder? Well, you know, it's interesting in that there's really no comparison. The rover was designed to operate in 1.6G on a lunar surface, and we could never really simulate that on the Earth. They tried to simulate 1.6G in the, the centrifuge building on wires, and that didn't work. You could drive it across uh, a trainer we had, you could drive it across the Earth, 1G, that wasn't the same. And you really never got a chance to feel what it was like to drive it till you got to the moon. But I gotta tell you, that's one of the most brilliant pieces of engineering this country or the world has ever come up with. It was absolutely spectacular. The way it unfolded, and I could go on for hours about that thing, but it was a as a lot of you already know, it was an electrically powered car. Each wheel had its independent drive, and we had front and rear steering on it. So it could drive around rocks and boulders and craters. And the lunar surface is absolutely irregular. There's nothing level about it. There are small rocks, big rocks, small craters, big craters, shadowed craters, no craters. It's really tough to drive it. On the other hand, it's very responsive, and it's just a superb piece of machinery. We went all of about 12 miles an hour, but that's really fast on the moon. And the real challenge was poor old Jim sitting in the right seat. You know, when you're driving a car, it's okay. You can drive the car. The person in the car, not knowing where you're going, has a tough time. And old Jim was hanging on for dear life. <laughs> but he said, hey, this is like a bucking bronco. I said, yeah, it sure was. But anyway, it was a, a, a brilliant piece of machinery. It got us around. We went about 26 kilometers, uh, three different sites, and it provided the transport not only for uh, Jim and I, but for extra geology tools and the rocks and that sort of thing. So it was a, a fabulous machine. And I wish Dick had had a chance to drive it on 18. It was his turn. It was his time to go. And if somebody in this country will get around to it, we'll go 18, right, Chick? Right. There you go. Think about this. Dave. I could have been the 13th man to walk on the moon. That's right. <laughs> uh, Dick, uh, I know you, uh, as the backup commander, went through a lot of the same stuff that, that uh, the prime crew did. Uh, just tell us about that. Uh, being a backup crewman for a... Lunar mission has to be uh, a lot to do. Not nearly as much maybe as going. Well, I, but. I really didn't have to do anything. Dave and Al did it all. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, held their hands now and then. Uh, Jerry, excuse me, just a minute. Neil, I want to add to your repertoire and sprinkle a little more salt water around. 16 and 17 were commanded by naval aviators also. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think uh, Al and I worked very, very close. Well, Dave and I probably spent more time together than, uh, than uh, anybody else because I worked, backed him, backed up him on Gemini 8, flew together, trained with him on Apollo 9, Apollo 12, and backed up uh, Dave on 
on 15, but uh, I think the big thing was uh, Al came to me and, and said, what, what's this being alone and being on the backside of the moon? What kind of support do you think you're going to have? <laughs> and I said, Al, one thing you got to remember, what happens on the backside of the moon <laughs> stays on the backside of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about no communications. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think You're so. out of sight of everybody, right? Uh, what are you leading Whatever up to? happens back there, right? Is that what it you're trying to say? stays back there. Well, you should know you were there before me. <laughs> so anything, anything, anything you told you? me, Dick, you know, I took everything you told me very seriously. Uh, Especially okay. when I'm flying in an airplane with you. Okay. That's probably enough of that. Uh, Jerry, I was, All right. I was going to add to that, if you don't mind. Okay, go ahead. You know, there, Dick, you tell, me, them, tell them about flying. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that for 40 years. Tell them about flying from El Paso Damn to L.A. rookies, you no. never know what to do. I think I'm losing control here, so. Uh, <laughs> no, there, I want to say this. You asked about a support group for the uh, command module pilots, and uh, I think we really need to have one because there were 12 guys that walked on the moon. We call them moonwalkers. I wonder if that has anything to do with Michael Jackson. <laughs> uh, there are only six of us that were by ourselves in the command module, so we do need a support group. There's no question. There's about no that. doubt about it. All right. Oh, no, there's four of us left. Oh, Michael. You, I, I, Mike yeah, Collins, yeah, and yeah, T.K. Yeah, yeah. Mattingly, so we, we do need a little support. Okay. <laughs> we got down to the moon. We'll come back to, the, uh, uh, to Vance in a second, but we got down to the moon, and, uh, of course, Joe Allen was, uh, he was the voice during that whole period, and uh, I can remember, and I was a flight director for most of that, uh, and I can remember some fantastic shots at Hadley Rill or the boggy marsh or wherever uh, you landed. Um, and uh, Joe, um, say something about the EVAs. They were pretty dynamic and uh, some tremendous pictures were taken and actually with the Rover we had essentially full-time television and it was pretty high def for its day. It was very, very clear. We could see just if they positioned and we could actually control it on the ground too, but uh, we had some great, great uh, shots. So, Joe, talk about the EVAs. Jerry, Jerry, thank you. I really appreciate this. Again, I'm Joe Allen. I'm at most a very small footnote in this cast of characters. Uh, yeah. But I had, a, I had a great fun as the capsule communicator during this time. And uh, uh, Jim and Dave always, and, and Al, you referred to me as Joe. During that time, I got several letters addressed to Joe, United States of America. <laughs> and it came from all over the world, and it came to me. There was another letter that came, and Jerry, uh, I'm not sure I've forgiven you for this yet. You had it read, I think, during one of the nighttime shifts. We were not on, but it was read on the net to NASA Public Affairs, and uh, it read as follows. Um, Hi, my name is Michael. I'm a 14-year-old kid in Kansas. I know I'm too young to be an astronaut, but this job of Joe looks really easy. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to do it on Apollo 16 and 17. <laughs> and everybody found that very amusing, Jerry, except me. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, thank you for your remarks. I, uh, although I take a little uh, issue with uh, the title of the site. You know, you landed in this sea of tra tranquility. And if memory serves, there's a park in Houston, Tranquility Park, dedicated. And at that time, you observed it was lucky you didn't land in the sea of fertility. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jerry, you're questioning me. The EVAs. <laughs> the EVAs. Um, they were extraordinary, and uh, we had very good communication. We had very good uh, TV coverage, as Jerry recalls. I also worked under Jerry's uh, uh, direction and tutelage, and as I've done most of my life, 
And uh, Jerry, it was great fun. We had a tr I so enjoyed Dave working with you and your crew, but I also enjoyed working with Gene Kranz and Jerry and others. And I remember when you and Jim were wrestling with the drill stuck in the moon, there were other glitches going on. And Jerry turned to me and said, Joe, get the drill out of the moon. I'll deal with the other glitches. I don't know if yep. you remember yep. that, Jerry. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you and Jim were able to get the drill out of the moon. And I, I said, thank goodness I don't let the air out. But uh, <laughs> it, it didn't. And the drill came up. And it was the first core stems that came back from the lunar surface that were really terrific. And yeah. I think, Jack, you would know more about the science that came from that. But uh, the last thing that I'll mention is I had studied physics in Germany for a couple of years. And there were a number of television stations from all over the world. And at the end of my shift, they had press conferences, and I did an interview to Germany, uh, in, uh, in German, uh, to several uh, television and radio stations there. And at the end of that, I said, this is remarkable. I've never made a call across the Atlantic Ocean before. And they looked at me like I was crazy yeah. because I'd been talking to the moon <laughs> uh, for, for hours. And in a sense, that puts, uh, that puts this mission in context of the technology that we had then it was so expensive to make a call across the Atlantic Ocean. I, we we uh, government workers couldn't afford to do it. And yet we were talking back and forth to the moon. What a time. What an era. And there will come a time when humans try to go back to the moon and they're going to discover how difficult it is. It is. You know, <laughs> go ahead, Dave. Dave. I, 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 a little side story here. Part of our geology training actually was to get together in the crew quarters after dinner with geologists who would lecture and we'd talk about going to Hadley Marsh, Hadley Rill, whatever <laughs> you want to call it, buddy thing, <laughs> and, and what was there and what we did and what we should do. And we had the whole team there, including Joe. Joe was also our chief scientist for the crew. And uh, I got to tell you, Joe did a magnificent job communicating with us on the moon because sometimes Jim and I weren't exactly communicative. <laughs> but <laughs> Joe smoothed it over with him. But nevertheless, one evening we were having this discussion with a geologist and you know, we'd have a, have a drink before dinner and have a nice dinner with Lou, our, our chef. And then we'd go into the conference room and have a geology lecture and talk about all sorts of things. And one of the things we talked about was names of the craters, because we had to cover so much area. We had to have names rather than numbers. But another thing we talked about towards the end of the training was, what can we do on 15 that would be unique, interesting, educational, and fun? Well, probably the most ink, the most video the kids see about Apollo 15 these days is a hammer and the feather. Yep. That was Joe's idea. It was his idea to come up with it and say, hey, here is a lesson for the kids that you can do. And Joe, thanks a bunch. I mean, we got more mileage on that than anything we did, believe it or not. But that was Joe's idea. Great. Jack, you had one thing. Something. Yeah, just uh, speaking of mileage, uh, mention one thing. Uh, my uh, mentor in the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Gene Shoemaker, that you all, uh, many of you have met, uh, in the late Gene Shoemaker, uh, used the term perspicacious for what he wanted uh, people on the moon to be. And the Apollo 15 pair, uh, Dave and Jim, were perspicacious enough to recognize uh, on uh, their EVA that something was very different in one location and they immediately photographed it and sampled it. That sample sort of lay undiscovered almost until uh, Gene and I found the orange soil on Apollo 17. And all of a sudden, somebody remembered that Apollo 15 had sampled green soil. And it turns out those two samples are probably, the, uh, the right now, are the hottest items in the lunar sample community, because right. uh, within them, they now have found uh, the existence of water within the glass. 
And, uh, and thanks, guys. You may not be aware of just how important that your sample was. And, and, and it, it just shows you the, the value of the kind of training and the value of the kind of people that we sent to the moon. Al, short. I, I just want to make a very quick comment. It's always been interesting to me that there are several dozen geologists training two guys to walk around on about a one square mile surf area of the moon, and there's one guy who trained us for lunar geology where we covered 25% of the moon, Dick and I. So I just always thought that was kind of interesting yeah, that they had right. all the help, they had all the help they could use. Right. Um, <laughs> and they could have used some more. Um, I want to say something about Joe, uh, and I'm sure most of you know it. Uh, after Apollo, Joe went on to fly the shuttle twice um, and did some EVA work, which was pretty fantastic. I still think the shot of, of you standing on the rail, as I recall, it was on the rail, some kind of foothold or something, holding a satellite that they had retrieved that was humongous. And here's Joe hanging onto that thing. Um, and it was a great shot. But anyway, Joe did go Jerry, on to... Uh, Jerry, that's when you and I were both six feet tall. That's right, that's right. That's before, that's before this crew got to us. Um, and kind of to segue into Vance Brand, um, Vance was getting ready as a backup on 15, would have been on 18. Um, and I want him to talk about that experience because he then did go fly ASTP. He was command module pilot on ASTP, and he commanded three shuttle flights. So we've got a guy sitting at, almost uh, right in the middle there that has flown in space a bunch. Vance, uh, tell us about getting ready for, for this mission and how that might, you might even make a segue of how that helped you on ASTP, if it did, uh, and then on into the shuttle. Okay, uh, well, First, let me point out that uh, we had uh, four, four rookies on the mission, and we had two experienced guys. And so these uh, two leaders, experienced guys, who did a terrific job, Dave and Dick, uh, they had a, quite a burden dealing with four rookies. Uh, I, I was, uh, I guess what you'd call a junior rookie because three of them were on prime crews, and I was on a backup crew. But I, uh, I really learned uh, a lot out of that. I learned the command module and the mission, and uh, by observing uh, our two leaders, uh, learned quite a bit about uh, leadership. I don't know if I ever applied it later, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I learned a lot. <clears throat> uh, I have to ask Joe, I guess, because he and I flew on one of the shuttle missions together. But uh, the, the mission was just fascinating. It was uh, the best job you could have to be a, a prime or a backup on that mission. And uh, so it, I, I felt, really got me ready for, for later on. And of course, we've never uh, Jack and I have never forgotten a uh, uh, good relationship with we ha had with our commander, Dick. Uh, matter of fact, we still call him the commander. <laughs> We're very, very respectful. Other names. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was uh, really great, beneficial. Great. Um, we... Um, Quick yes, story. you may, Commander. During the, <laughs> Is that the last one? this will be my last one, I'm sure. But you know, during the uh, limb liftoff ascent stage from the lunar surface, just as they lifted off, there was this hellacious racket that came over the net. Somebody was playing some very, very loud music, and uh, nobody could figure out where in the world it came from. And uh, nobody could talk while this music was, Al, this is my story. This is my what is story. What's going on here? Well, listen, and you'll learn something. I don't think so. Deal with it. 
Anyway, it went on for several minutes and nobody could talk to anybody. I have a two-part question, Al. What That's did, what, what, yeah, for you. Oh, what, okay. what did Dave say to you after that when he got back in the command module? The second part of the question is, there was three Air Force guys, Al, Dave, and, and Jim, superb Air Force pilots, but I would like to know the music that you played at liftoff why in the hell did you select Anchors Away? <laughs> All right, let me, let, me, let, me, let me answer your second question first, right? Dave and Jim had been on a lunar surface for three days driving a Jeep and walking. That is not a normal job for an Air Force guy, right? Air Force people generally fly airplanes and they're in the sky. I thought it only appropriate to play the Air Force song as they're getting ready to come off the surface. Now, I have to admit, I, play, I thought I was playing it to Mission Control, but what I didn't know was that I think Mission Control had the switch up that <laughs> retransmitted know. it back to the lunar module, and they got it in their ear as they're getting ready to take off from the moon. And I'm so, I apologize one more time. <laughs> I know I apologized in orbit after you guys docked, but I'll apologize one more time for Mission control. Yeah. He says we had a switch in the wrong position. You know, so. Okay. Um, we saw a thing. They say something about the fallen astronaut memorial. Uh, just, you know, kind of how that all came about. Uh, we saw the picture here in the video. And uh, Well, again, it's, we had these conversations about what do you do? You know, we train geology, we learn how to land on the moon, LLTV, ALZVA, you know, heavy duty training, but we also took some time in the evenings or at the beach house to talk about other parts of the life in the world and what you do. And we were fortunate that there were 14 guys who put their lives down so that we could get to where we were. And we decided one evening sometime, I don't remember when, but we thought, we should recognize them and honor them for contributing all they had so we could get to where we were. So we had this little plaque design, the little model of a fallen astronaut, and one of the last things I did on the moon, in fact, Jim reminded me of it, we were closing out, uh, had to put the rover back in the back so the TV could be pointed. And you know, one thing I liked about Jim, people don't, Jim and I were, we really were like brothers. We had signals. We had all sorts of intuitive signals about doing this or doing that and, and missing this and missing that or getting it done. And Jim sort of did me this as we were closing out and pointed down to the pocket. And I had the plaque in my pocket and I thought, oh, yep, I better do that. So I went out and I put the, the plaque out and a little miniature astronaut out there, took a couple pictures and I felt pretty good about that. And so did Jim and so did Al, that we recognize some guys who had really, on both sides of the Iron Curtain, who had really contributed everything to get to where we were, which was fortunate for us, and we appreciated all that and wanted to leave something for them. Great. It was a great deal. I didn't know about it until you got back, actually. But it yeah, was there were a pretty lot of cool. things. There were a lot yeah. of things. That oh, that's okay. I didn't mind. <laughs> that, was, that was fine. Um, I didn't need to know. Oh, everything. Now let me, uh, one final thing that I wanted to talk about the mission itself. And then I'm gonna let uh, Dave have some time here. Um, you noticed in the picture that on, uh, when they landed, one of the chutes had collapsed. And uh, I went back over that transcript before I came out here. And uh, I wanna ask you, Al, to kind of go through that sequence. Turns out we only needed two shoots. It was two shoots were safe. But describe it, what you saw, when you saw, and also what the landing was like um, in terms of uh, you know, that December. You know, Gary, that's, that, that's kind of an interesting question in light of some discussions that we had this afternoon on the bus. Because what we were told on the bus today was that some of the analysis of the problem with that shoot had to do with a D-ring or something that came loose and the risers, the risers let yeah. loose, right? Uh, and then the other side of that story was 
that we had purged the fuel lines of the hypergolics and they went up in the, they, they followed the risers up and they burned big holes in the parachute. I am absolutely amazed at these guys who make analyses of what happened on a flight without asking me when I'm sitting there in my seat looking out the window and watching it happen. You saw Nobody three, you said saw three shoots, a right? word. You saw three shoots, right? I saw three shoots. I saw holes develop in one shoot, get bigger and bigger and bigger. The shoot, I never saw a riser go bad. There was no such thing. Saw the holes get bigger and bigger and bigger. The shoot finally streamed. We came down on two shoots as we were, as we were getting down to the water. The second shoot was developing holes. Uh oh. Now we lost all the shoots because when they, when they cut loose, they they sunk they and they never got it back. Uh, but we lost the one shoot, and it was because of the uh, of the fuel fuel purge on the way down. What was the landing like? <coughs> Curious. Was it hard? How would I know? Yeah. It's all over before I even thought about it. Yeah, they're all, they're all different. And I, I might make a point relative to what Commander Gordon has discussed this evening. Well, you know, when the command module lands in the water, there are two stable positions, and it's floating. One is with the apex up, which is called stable one, and the other is with the apex down, which is pointing down into the water, which is called stable two, and there are some balloons that you blow up to get it back up. Well, I would like to make the point, the Air Force crew stayed in stable one. Yeah. Some of the naval crews ended up in stable two. Don't they like stable two? <laughs> Navy guys like stable two, right? Well, I guess they like I to think swim. They, do. they like to swim. They're they, twice as stable as well, you are. Well, they're, they're Navy guys. They like to look out the window into the water, not into the air, right? All right, let me, Joe, 30 seconds. Any final point you want to make? No, only that this is a great celebration, and I want to thank uh, the Astronaut Scholarship folks for organizing it. Jack? Uh, uh, I just, uh, great to see Al and uh, Jim and Walt and another <laughs> Tom. It just, uh, these kind of gatherings uh, bring us all together and uh, they uh, had a chance to talk with a bunch of people who uh, have been working the shuttle for many years and a, and a couple who actually worked Apollo. Uh, they all seem to be younger than the, those yeah. of us up here. Well, like Hard to believe. Ones. And it's just uh, been a wonderful occasion. And I join Joe in thanking you all for making it possible. Vance? Uh, <clears throat> doesn't seem like 40 years. It went by real fast. Uh, one thing I would like to... Uh, mention is that uh, you look around this place, you see the crawler, the, uh, the Saturn V, the pad, and everything. And you think back to the leaders we had back then, uh, George Lowe, uh, we had uh, a, lo a lot of leaders, uh, in, some of them German, uh, some from in from England, various parts of the world, but uh, they were all big thinkers. And uh, because of that big thinking, why uh, our country and uh, history really benefited. Uh, school kids 500 years from now will know the name uh, Neil Armstrong. Now, I hope in the future we can uh, continue at some kind of a pace like that, takes those kind of leaders and uh, I think it's great what we've done the last 50 years. I just uh, hope that uh, someday we can uh, be proceeding like that in the future. I'm, I'm not so sure we are. Yeah. But. Dick? Dick? Well, Gary, it, uh, it was a real privilege uh, for me to have worked with Dave for so many trips around the Horn and, and Al and, and, and Jim, they taught me a lot. I thought I knew everything, and I learned from them, and I hardly knew anything. But uh, by working with them, they trained me very well for my next flight on Apollo 7, oops, excuse me, 18. Uh, and I thank you yeah. both very much for that.
Al? I'd um, just quickly like to say how honored and pleased and happy I am that you're all here tonight helping us celebrate something that occurred 40 years ago uh, that was maybe one of the best things this country has ever done. We do not see that today. We won't see that for a while. And I think it's just wonderful that you are here to help us celebrate the 40th anniversary of Apollo 15. And I thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Okay, and we will leave the final word to uh, Dave Scott, commander of Apollo 15. Well, let me, let me take a couple minutes. Uh, a lot of things struck me today, one of which was I keep hearing 40 years, 40 years, 40 <laughs> years, 40 years. I mean, good grief, 40 years, Al, 40 years. You're younger than I am, Dave, so oh, be careful. Geez. But it's rather remarkable. But we, we took a little tour today, and uh, we went out past uh, the beach house, because I wanted my family to see the beach house. And few people realize that during Apollo, we'd spend two to three weeks a month here. Our simulators were here, uh, command module, the lunar module simulator, the spacecraft went through all sorts of altitude chamber tests, a lot of other tests, the rock pile, the suits. We spent a lot of time here. And we went out to the beach house, which was a sanctuary, a place we could go without having anybody come up to us and because of all the things going on, we walked down the hall and a guy would come up with good intentions and say, you got a minute, you got a minute, you got a minute, you got a minute? We could go out to the beach house and do some thinking. So I wanted people to see that. But on the way to the beach house, we went past pad 19. That's the Gemini pad. And that brought back some, some old memories for me. Uh, in fact, I recalled that when Neil and I were down here getting ready for Gemini 8 uh, early in 1966, we were here one weekend and we thought, well, let's go look at the Apollo stuff because they were just building it. And uh, so we drove out to the VAB was being built and the firing was built, being built. And of course, in the, the blockhouse, on pad 19, they have something like, I don't know, 20, 25 consoles in this big bunker. And we walked into the firing room for Apollo, and there were 240 consoles in there. And I remember looking at Neil, and I thought, no way. There's no way this is going to work. And we went into the VAB, which a lot of you saw today, and you look up at that, and you say, it ain't going to work. It is too big. It too is big. just too big. And the remarkable thing about it is, it all worked. We never had a Saturn failure. Almost every mission went on time. With the exception of Jim Lovell's bad break, they brought him home and it worked. Everything else worked. It's absolutely remarkable. And it takes me back again to my beginnings in this business. When I flew on Jiminy 8 and we had this problem, which Neil got us out of the problem, and I'll always be grateful, Neil, for giving us both a second chance because Neil got us out of the box and we got back down and we both had a second chance. And for that, I'll be ever grateful. You done good, boss. You done yeah. good. <laughs> and, then, and, and then we get to 15 and I get the two best guys in the world. Chair Irwin, bless his heart, I loved him. He was the best partner you could have on the moon. Jim kept me squared away, and he always did it. It was sort of like, hey, Dave, don't you think we ought to do this? Which meant you're screwing up. Fix it, you know? <laughs> but he was a wonderful guy, and I really, really enjoyed my relationship with Jim. We had a great time. And we had Al to take care of the command module, and you know, he pointed out, we we're on a surface for three days, and he was alone for three days. And he had to be there when we got back. He had to do a big maneuver to change planes so we could catch him. And there he was all by himself. I never worried one minute. I was never concerned for one second. I knew Al would be there. So thanks. He got us back. Uh, and then, and, and a final thing that struck me today 
we had this nice champagne reception. And, and Lynn, you put a great show together for us, thank you. And the introduction, and I was standing there looking. You know, I remember when I was a little kid, and we used to choose up sides to play game, baseball or basketball or something, you know. I always wanted to get on the side with the big guys. You know, the guys are really good guys. And I watched those guys go back on that, on the film today at the Champagne reception. Do you know what? Those were the big guys. That was the A squad. Those were the franchise players. That was the first team. And I'm proud to have been included in that team. And I thank you guys, all of you. You're terrific. That's what I got. Great. There you go. Well, that does it. Um, I just want to say, uh, I, this has been a big honor to be here. Uh, uh, kind of like going back to uh, what Dave did with uh, getting the ground people involved in the, uh, in the geology training along with Jack. Um, being included is uh, super. It is a great honor. And particularly to share this with people that have not lived in this environment all the time is especially um, uh, fun to do. And so all of you that, that uh, have come from a long way away, some of you, and, and enjoyed, uh, I know so far, I think it's time to go get some dessert. And uh, I want to thank the panel, except uh, I sure feel sorry that I left Joe out. I don't, God, I'll never hear the end of this one. Uh, <laughs> So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Charlie. Thanks, Jerry. Wait a minute, guys. Wait, wait. Hold it. Hold it. We want to get a photograph. So uh, hold your places. And uh, where's our photographer? For, OK. So uh, look up at the, photo, at the you want us photographer. Where do you want us? Where do you want us, Carl? OK. That tells us a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a quick photo. All right. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Come here. Come here. I wasn't in this. <laughs> OK. Come on. Get close. All right. OK. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. What a great evening. We're going to have dessert inside uh, and coffee. So back out this way where we came in. One, huh? Okay. And uh, we still, the auction is still uh, open. So please bid and bid high. And you got till 1040 uh, to uh, get your bids in. So thanks to God for everybody, Jerry, and everybody for causing this. It was a great evening. Thank you, guys.